from your view of mm. how long do you think it took to build pyramids? God, I don't know. I've heard, you know, I mean, some of the various accounts was it, um, I've heard, you know, 20 years based upon some writings. I don't really know. Um, certainly given the technology we assume they had in the old kingdom times, it would take a very long time. It's a lot of work there. And, you know, <clears throat> engineers and scientists and builders and architects have all looked, come up with various schemes for how the pyramid could be built. But even the most sophisticated of those schemes still imply a huge effort. And to be able to, to quarry <clears throat> the stones, particularly form the, the, the white limestone casing stones, and cut those stones and fit them with such precision, and to be able to move those stones into play, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a conundrum how it was built. <clears throat> I'm not sure that anybody has the, <clears throat> excuse me, the final answer on it. Um, I don't claim to know. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, it's still a mystery, I think, how, how the pyramids were built. And, and see, it's so out of context because the assumption is that you basically had subsistence farming in the Nile Valley for thousands of years. And then within, what, two generations, these farmers basically are building a structure like the Great Pyramid, it just doesn't make sense, you know? And even you can talk about pharaohs and their egos all you want, but I mean, that's easy to say. But to build a structure like the Great Pyramid with what, 2.3 million stones in it, almost perfectly oriented to the cardinal directions over a 13 acre leveled site, and put these stones together with the precision and Oh, oh, and just maybe what by accident end up get, getting this this unique geometry built in there and this geodesy, etc. No, I it, it just you know, I think that it's almost gets down to where you're oriented psychologically and emotionally. Some people just can't deal with the fact that history might be other than what they've been spoon fed. That it's this nice curve that does this, and that there's no mystery back here. Well, it was just you know um, basically roving migrant hunter-gatherers and then later subsistence farmers. But then all of a sudden, within two centuries, you've got a huge wave of building in Egypt. You know, you've got it in, in, in Asia. You've got the first wave of great monumental earthworks architecture in North America being built precisely at the same time, right? In Sumeria, you know, in along the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, in um, you know, the great ziggurats and the, the, the seven cities of Mesopotamia, Ur and Uruk and these, well, they were being built at the same time. So it's almost like, again, it's almost like the orders went out, the, you know, the bell went off and then everybody in these various cultures got up and within a matter of a decade or two, they're building these incredible structures. And then it seems like as fast as it started, boom, it was over with. So that to me is an interesting mystery of history that has not been adequately resolved. But clearly there's more going on in history than, than the standard models will allow for. You know, um, and when you look to me, you look at the Great Pyramid, you can either do one of the things, you can just shut your eyes and you can just dismiss it and say, oh, that you're just playing with numbers and stuff. Sure, but it's there. You know, it is a fact that if you scale the pyramid up by 43,200, you're going to get, in a sense, a scale model of the northern hemisphere of the Earth. I'm sorry, it's there. You either ignore it or you explain it away by saying it's just a coincidence, but you don't accept the fact that whoever designed, the architects that designed the Great Pyramid, may have known the size and shape of the Earth, because that's the implication. Now, if that was the only thing, if that was all by itself, the only thing that stuck out as anomalous, well, we could maybe ignore it, but it isn't. It's part of a whole body of things that don't make sense within the framework of the conventional models. And that's what Graham Hancock has been getting at for 20 some years, is saying, if we look at the past, there are just too many things that don't fit. 
that, that, that standard narrative of, you know, hunter-gatherers, subsistence farmers, and then this slow arc up to modern civilization. What appears to be the more accurate um, graph of civilization, just like life on Earth, is sawtooth. It rises and then it collapses, rises again and collapses, rises again and collapses. And see, I think maybe there's a lot of folks that might struggle with the idea that we might just be one in a long succession of civilizations that have existed on this planet. And it's easy for them to dismiss the possibility because they don't understand the degree to which this planet has undergone complete renovation repeatedly. And if they did, they would understand how whatever may have existed in terms of the artifacts of civilization 20 or 30 or 50,000 years ago or longer, why we would find no trace of them. Because they do not understand how sweeping some of these great upheavals and catastrophes have been. Once you really begin to understand that, and there's very few people on Earth today who have gotten this. It's taken me 40 years of study into the, into the literature, um, talking to scientists that are ge geologists that are doing the work, going with Bradley, my colleague, out into the field, covering, what, 50,000, 60,000 miles in the field, before you can begin to put the pieces together and understand, yes, it's, it's obvious. This planet has been remodeled to such an extent that whatever was here before, it's gone. See, that's the problem we're confronted with. And so it becomes easy for people to just, you know, turn their back on this anomalous evidence that's out there and just assume there's some authority out there that has it figured out. I see this on all the time online when people are challenging me, well, well, what would the, you know, the real geologist, what would the real archaeologist, what would the real you know, whatever, say. But the point is, is that, you know, knowledge is so fragmented that, you know, yeah, somebody might understand, you know, there may be an archaeologist who has spent 20 years on one dig, and he can tell you in great detail every single thing about that dig and the life ways of those people that live there. That doesn't necessarily mean he sees the big picture. It doesn't necessarily mean that he sees that this particular social group disappeared at the same time as another social group two or 3,000 miles away disappeared, right? We can see in North America, the Clovis culture, they were, there are at least 50 known Clovis sites in North America um, that existed right at the end of the last ice age. They all disappeared at the same time. But if you were just looking at the original Clovis site out in, in New Mexico, for example, you wouldn't necessarily know that it disappeared at the same time as a Clovis site over on the Savannah River in Georgia, see? But now that we're in a position where we are getting the dating, we're able to look and see, yeah, they all disappeared at the same time. Coincidence or is there some agency involved, see? <clears throat> and that's the point we are now coming. We're, 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 you know, status quo science, hard science, it's beginning to recognize what a lot of the fringe researchers have been saying for 20 and 30 and 40, even 50 years. Yeah, there have been catastrophes in Earth history, and that we have to be open to the idea that there have been civilizations and cultures that have come before us that, that did achieve a high level of sophistication and knowledge, and they've disappeared and left very little trace of their existence. To At this point, to <clears throat> refuse to look at that is nothing but its closed-mindedness. You know, that's all that is. Um, so... I think we're at the kind of a front end of a major paradigm shift in the next decade or two where we begin to understand that we go back 4,000 to 5,000 years of recorded history, but modern humans have been on the earth at least 40 times that long. Yet in all of that span of time from 180 to 200,000 years ago down to the beginnings of recorded history, nobody figured out how to how to accumulate knowledge and pass it on. Nobody was able to come up with, well, yes, we've each generation learns something and teaches the next generation, and eventually, you know, there, there are a lot of mysteries and questions that need to be addressed about this vast time that humans have been on Earth prior to our written record of that. Because the written record is this, but 
the whole time that human beings have been on the planet is 40 times that long, see? So I think that we're on the verge of penetrating this veil that separates, say, the modern incarnation of the human species from the primordial incarnation. And the veil that separates these two is this this events of the Younger Dryas, these events that occurred at the end of the last ice age during the transition through the age of Leo. And this is why when you look at the Sphinx, which is symbolic, the Sphinx in Egypt, what is it? Lion and man. In the zodiacal wheel, the lion and the man is Leo Aquarius, right? And that's that axis. 13,000 years ago, the spring equinox was pointing to Leo and the winter the fall equinox was pointing to Aquarius. Now it's going to be just the opposite 13,000 years later. So that number, which was half the cycle, that has come up over and over and over again in, in occult and esoteric literature, in the metaphysics and so on. And now we've got scientists using radiocarbon dating who are dating this, these events when the Clovis culture disappeared, when the great megafauna disappeared, when there were these amazing upheavals and they're all coming in at 12,900 years. And so they are coming up with a date completely independent of what the archaic tradition has been telling us for decades. See? So there we have a conversion. And I don't think, I don't know of having now, you know, gotten to know a number of the scientists that are involved in doing the Younger Dryas Boundary Research and reading most of their papers, I don't know that any of them are aware of the fact that the number 12,960 was prominent in these ancient archaic traditions of, of geometry. That's amazing to know. Yeah, it is, isn't it? And, you know, and, and it's the kind of stuff that, you know, if, you, you know, if you're at all skeptical, you can, you can verify this all yourself. You can go to the same sources that I did, which were, you know, um, you know, the U.S. Geological Survey, um, who's, who has, has all this data on the Earth. You can go to the three or four independent surveys. And it's accessible for anyone. Yeah, yeah, right. It's pretty much the Smithsonian Institute publishes geodetic tables. That's where I got the ones that we were looking at here. And they, they're based upon, you know, dozens of ongoing uh, uh, measurements of the size and shape of the Earth. Because they have to know that with precise precision in order to, you know, have satellites orbit and all of that, you know. So, um, it's there. It sounds like a lot of work to research into all those numbers and... It is. <clears throat> but it's a lot of fun if you're into that kind of thing. And, um, you know, it's fun when you connect the dots, when you, when you see this for the first time. And that, that quote that I did from William R. Fix, he was the one, to my knowledge, who really put this, for, who first discovered this geodetic, how elegant this geodetic information was encoded into the pyramid. I hope he's still alive and maybe he's still writing books, but I haven't seen anything lately. Who knows, maybe if he's out there, he'll watch this. And I'll just say that I was a big fan of your work, William, if you're still around. Um,